Welcome to the Manitoba Institute's Policy Research and Citizen Series Policy Pizza in a Pint on Saving Lake Winnipeg. My name is Robert Ermel and I'm the Director of Operations for the Manitoba Institute for Policy Research. I want to thank you all for coming out this evening. We do have a full house indeed. The Institute uh, seeks to enhance uh, public policy discourse in the province of Manitoba by nourishing dialogue and debate on current and emerging issues facing Manitobans and their governments. Policy Pizza in a Pint events are designed to situate and discuss important public policy issues facing the province and the country in an informal manner. Tonight's topic is saving Lake Winnipeg. Lake Winnipeg has been recognized by the Global Nature Fund as one of the most threatened lakes in the world. A multitude of environmental hazards put the lake at risk, leaving Manitobans with many questions. Where is the excess phosphorus in the lake coming from? How can it be reduced? What are the dangers of having large areas of water covered in algae? And what can be done to restore the health of the lake? Discussing uh, these topics and answering our questions this evening, are uh, Norm Branson, Dr. Henry Fenema, close enough, close, so close, okay, and it's Dr. Hank. It's Hank, by the way. It's Hank. Oh, sorry, yeah, most Hank. Of the time. And uh, Dr. Uh, Alexis, and I've got a type over. Kidding him. There we go. Uh, Norm Branson is the uh, chair of the Forum for Leadership on Water and was the deputy minister of the Departments of Environment and Conservation and Water Stewardship for 15 years and served for three years in the Manitoba Clean Environment Commission. <coughs> Dr. Hank Fenema is the Vice President of Business Development of the International Institute for Sustainable Development. He has led the Institute's research on water and agricultural issues in Western Canada and led the creation of the Institute's Water Innovation Centre in 2009. Dr. Alexis Cannon is the Executive Director of the Lake Winnipeg Foundation where she is spearheading the development of the Foundation's Lake Winnipeg Health Club. She is an alumnus of the University of Manitoba, where she received her doctorate in environmental science. A moderator this evening will be doctor, not doctor. They're <laughs> promoting Dan to doctor, doctor of news. This is Dan Lett. Uh, Dan is a columnist to the Winnipeg Free Press. He has worked at bureaus covering every level of government, from City Hall to the National Bureau in Ottawa. Uh, as you can see from the people here tonight, uh, that this is an important discussion for all of Manitoba. And at the end of tonight's uh, discussion, I enjoy, encourage you to complete your feedback forms that are on your tables. And I encourage you, uh, after the panel's discussion, uh, to make sure you put up your hand and uh, Dan will be happy to engage you in the conversation. So I'll pass the mic over to Norm to start us off. Uh, thanks. I, I think you hear me? Yeah. Okay. Thanks. I get to uh, uh, set the table, so to speak, and uh, Hank has kind of agreed to uh, flip the overheads. And I ask you to keep your eye on them because I'm uh, cutting down about a half hour presentation in 10 minutes. So there'll be things up there that I won't talk about that are probably important to please take note of as you go along. And I'll say next. Yeah, that, that's just generally the uh, categorization of what I'm going to talk about. Next. Uh, Lake Winnipeg represents a remnant of glacial Lake Agassiz. It was formed of a ton of that shrinking lake about 8,000 years ago. It's one of nine large lakes strung along the western face of the Canadian Shield, from Great Slave in the far north to Lake Ontario in the south. Lake Winnipeg is, I think you all know by now, is the 10th largest freshwater lake in the world. Interestingly, three of the top 30 lakes in the world happen to be contained wholly within the province of Manitoba. Surface area covers about 24,000 square kilometers, and that's substantially larger than the province of Prince Edward Island. The lake has two distinct basins connected by a very deep but narrow channel. The south basin is considerably smaller than the north. It's shallow, it's turbid. Uh, the north basin is larger and deeper. Uh, average depths, I think, about 12 meters in the south basin and about 17 meters in the north basin. So it's a very shallow lake. Right? Um, doesn't really show up very well on the map, but interestingly, there are over 650 islands on uh, Lake Winnipeg. The lake has been referred to as the Inland Sea. It's really got an even nastier reputation than the Eastern Great Lakes for killer storms. It contains about 25% of all the fresh water in Manitoba. 
It has a very short retention period, turning over its volume about every four years. And that's compared to, I think Lake Superior is something over a century in, in turning over its volume. Three major watersheds contribute over 80% of the inflow to Lake Winnipeg. And the only outlet is the Nelson River, which of course empties into Hudson Bay. The southern edge of the lake is moving slowly but inexorably south due to the post-glacial isostatic rebound, which is also greater in the north end of the lake than it is in the south. Uh, the drainage basin of the lake is enormous, as you can see from the map, draining part of four Canadian provinces and four American states. Although, actually, really only two American states. There's just a tiny little bit of Montana and South Dakota. Most of it's Minnesota and North Dakota. <clears throat> Next. Uh, it's about 990,000 square kilometers. It's the second largest drainage basin in North America. The ratio of land area drained to lake surface is the highest of any major lake, which is important as we get into talking about the problems associated with the lake. Although only about 6% of that watershed is in the United States, that's still a relatively significant area. In fact, it's about 180,000 square kilometers. So the lake itself isn't a boundary water. Uh, a, a very significant portion of its basin is subject to the Canada-U.S. Boundary Waters Treaty of 1909. Archaeological evidence places the earliest settlements around Lake Winnipeg almost coincident with its birth some 8,000 years ago. <coughs> it's always been a sacred body of water to Aboriginal peoples, providing both spiritual and physical sustenance. Both the Cree and the Ojibwe people simply called it the Great Lake. The Cree word describing the waters of the South Basin, Winnipeg, meaning turbid or muddy waters, has given name to both a lake and a city. And of course, uh, Lake Winnipeg was central to the fur trade. A significant Icelandic settlement was established in 1875 near where the community of Gimli stands today. The settlers actually formed a short-lived republic uh, back in those days, independent republic. The, the Icelanders actually managed to survive the bitter early winters only with the help of cheap Chief Penguis and his people, and that's a debt that's actually still acknowledged to this day by the Icelandic people that live in the area. In the latter part of the 19th century, a thriving commercial fishery began, and the lake became a favorite recreational retreat for people from the city of Winnipeg. Today, the basin is home to more than 6 million people. Uh, 23,000 of these are, can be said to live on the lake. There's about 10,000 cottages on the lake. Uh, half of the watershed is given over to agriculture, about 55 million hectares of farmland. Next. Uh, lake Winnipeg is now the third largest hydro reservoir in the world. Third or second, depending on which statistical list you look at. The natural flow regime has essentially been reversed. Spring and early summer runoff is now stored over the summer and fall to be released during the winter. And of course, it, it powers a bunch of hydro plants on the lower Nelson River, which serve, largely serve the U.S. export market. The lake's commercial fishery, which is now over a century old, has been reborn and has been booming over the last two decades. The lake and its associated hinterland are a rich source of ecological services, such as providing wetland and other wildlife habitat, the value of which may be incalculable. Next. While Lake Winnipeg has treated us well, unfortunately, we haven't returned the favor. Starting in the mid-90s, it has become apparent that something bad was happening to the lake. We might have noticed it sooner, but in our wisdom, we'd long since eliminated the meager research that was underway in the mid-70s. First early signs of trouble were increasing algal blooms, but in 2000, most of the North Basin was hit, and a few years later, the South Basin was struck. A huge increase in nutrient inflows to the lake had occurred starting in the mid-70s. The result was the increase in the frequency and extent of algal blooms throughout the lake. They're now annual events. Blue-green algae that produce toxins have become the predominant species in these blooms. 
These toxins, which are now routinely detected near shore during the blooms, are a danger to humans and animals. Research on the effect and state of the toxins is scanty. Recreational use of the lake is impossible during these events. The decaying organisms deplete oxygen in the water column. And this, of course, can have a catastrophic effect on the aquatic food chain, although no oxygen depleted dead spots have yet been found. The source of these additional nutrients, and there always have been natural nutrients, by the way, in flowing into Lake Winnipeg, are agricultural and urban fertilizers, intensive livestock wastes, and municipal and private sewage effluent. The pathways for these nutrients to reach the lake are the three major contributing watersheds and near shore runoff directly into the lake. Although our measures are approximations only, we can say that the Red River watershed is by far the largest nutrient source. We can also state that more than half the total nutrient load reaching the lake originates outside Manitoba. And even though less than 6% of the basin is in the U.S., more than a third of the nutrients come from our southern neighbors. Next. We know that nutrient transport and quantity, flow, uh, quantity of flow are intimately related. Assuming the quantity of nutrients on the landscape remains the same, and unfortunately that's not a reasonable assumption in my view, more flow on the rivers means more nutrients into the lake. The flow on the Red River has doubled over the past 20 years. It has increased by 33% in the Winnipeg River, and we're talking now about average annual flows. <coughs> In the North Basin, inflows from the Saskatchewan River have been in steady decline. This combined with the damming of the river has greatly reduced its sediment load, making the relatively clear waters in the north even clearer. The flight can penetrate further, less, less stimulating even further algal growth. And the lake is warming. Spring breakup on average comes later, or all the time. I shouldn't say all the time, well this year, but that's that. on average. All of these factors will both be very poorly for the health of, of Lake Winnipeg. Lake regulation appears to have introduced a further potential threat. More nutrients are being retained in lake sediments for possible future reintroduction as they are no longer being flushed out during the course of the summer. Much has been made of the comparison of Lake Winnipeg today with the condition of Lake Erie in the 1960s when Erie was described as dying. And the scientists presently studying the lake have cautioned against the application of this term to Lake Winnipeg. I think largely because we haven't detected any oxygen-starved dead spots in the lake as yet. Nonetheless, what is dying as the condition of the lake continues to deteriorate is the uses we make of it. And so simply because we say the lake isn't dying, let's not kid ourselves that somehow it isn't an immediate and critical problem. Next. There are other challenges facing Lake Winnipeg. Invasive species are a threat. Rainbow smelt in turn, in, in turn entered in the lake from Lake the Winnipeg River in 1990, and they've now proliferated throughout the lake. I'll read you a sentence because I'm reading off. I believe we're perilously close to the end of your time. Okay. Uh, if you'll give Actually, me you're at the end. <laughs> yes, I believe so. Oh, okay, apparently you've been extended time. Sorry. Sorry. Uh, <coughs> uh, I'll, I'll say very quickly, and, and I see people here actually who are very familiar with the uh, uh, institution, and that's the uh, Manitoba, uh, or the Lake Winnipeg Research Consortium. Uh, which started in 1999 and does great work on the lake and, and uh, researching the causes of the problem and, and the general ecology of the lake. Uh, I'll, I'll simply end by saying uh, we ought to be giving this, I think, a lot more urgency as a, as a problem than we are. Uh, everyone is, I think, fairly well aware that we've got a problem. I think there's a sense that we have a lot of time to deal with it. Uh, I don't believe we do. I believe we're talking a matter of a few years, not decades or, or uh, 40 or 50 year time. Uh, so I'll, I'll stop there. Thank you. Thanks,